Hello? Hello, sir. Constable Burnett calling from London Scottish and Midland Bank, Furling Avenue. The bank's been broken into, sir. And I think the night watchman's done for. Yes. Right.
Oh, I'm sorry to call at such an unusual hour, sir, but I noticed your light was on, so I knew you hadn't gone to bed. No, I haven't been sleeping very well lately, so I stay up rather late, uh, reading. Oh, indeed, sir. Uh, you are Mr Lambton Green, manager of the London Scottish and Midland Bank, round the corner. You know I am, Constable Burnett. <clears throat> this is an official visit, sir. I'm afraid I've some rather bad news for you. There's been a robbery at the bank. The culprit, whoever he is, appears to have removed a considerable sum of money from the strong room after overpowering the night watchman. But we who... think within the last hour, sir. And you say Mr. Melling was attacked? Attacked, tied up, chloroformed and asphyxiated. He's dead. Oh, my God. Poor man. You going away, sir? Uh, yes, I was just going away for a short holiday. Catch you an early train, aren't you, sir? Uh, no, I was going by car. Ah. Um, before you set off on your vacation, perhaps you'd accompany me to the bank. The inspector would like to have a word with you. He's there? In your office, sir, where the incident occurred. And he'll have seen the note I left. Note, sir? Where? On my desk. There was no note, sir? What? But I left it there this evening, just before I came home. For the director's explaining everything. Together with my keys. There was no note, sir. And no keys. Morning, oh, Mr. Reader. Uh, uh, I've let you have a nice long lie. Huh? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, good heavens, Mrs. Hutchin, it's nearly eight o'clock. I should be late at the office. Oh, dear me. They can surely manage without you for half an hour once in a while. Uh, would you pass me my gown, please? In all my years, such a thing has never occurred to me. I'm most distressed. You were very late last night. Perhaps you didn't realise it was nearly 11 o'clock at night before you returned from wherever you'd been. When you informed me you wouldn't be back to dinner, I naturally presumed you'd be occupied with one of your investigations. And I purposely didn't retire to my bed, in case you should be wanting the comfort of a cup of cocoa and a Garibaldi biscuit. My gown, please. I have only your best interests at heart, Mr. Reader. And I felt it my duty to see that after a long day's work you should get sufficient relaxation. Uh, I'm grateful for your concern, Mrs. Hoochin. And it was due to my long day's work that I took myself out to the local picture palace to see that admirable cowboy film actor, Mr. Thomas Mix, and his wonder horse. Oh, aye. Well, I naturally couldn't be expected to know that. Now get your tea while it's hot, Mr. Reader. And while you're dressing, I'll cook you a real man's breakfast. Oh. Yes, sir, she's my baby now. I don't mean maybe, yes, sir, she's my baby now. I don't know why. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Warfield. Why not, Miss Warfield? Oh, no. So you aren't. I beg your pardon. No, I'm Fiona Wentworth Brown. Oh, how do you do? Uh, my name is Rita. Oh, I know that. Daddy's spoken of you. Has he? Oh, and Mummy, too. Oh, indeed. And uh, in what circumstances? Oh, it was something to do with Daddy's firm, Mill Steinmark. Oh, yes, the merchant bankers. I did indeed make some inquiries for them. You caught the robber. Well, I was um, instrumental in his apprehension. Well, to think that I'm actually working for a real-life detective. I feel it's a real feather in my cap. You see, I only left Rodine last Easter. Well, Daddy didn't want me to, but Mummy's much more progressive, and so am I. And I thought that the sooner I could carve out a career for myself, the better. I mean, look at Ivy Williams. Oh, yes, the first lady barrister. Yes, indeed. So I got Daddy to ring up Uncle Jason. Uncle who? Him. 
You mean Sir Jason? They belong to the same club. Oh, he's not really my uncle. He just likes to be called that. <laughs> Such a friendly old fellow. It was send her along, he said, so here I am. Yes, well, I'm, I'm sure you'll settle down in no time. Oh, so am I. But I must let you into a little secret. What's that? Well, I'm not very good at typing. Oh, well, we have a pool. What, in the building? Oh, how wonderful. Yes, well, uh, if you'll excuse me, I, I fear I'm, I'm very late. Oh, yes, I know. Uncle Jason said it was the first time such a thing had ever happened. Did he? Yes. Oh, and he said something about, can you go and see him about a green file? Green file? Oh, yes. Lampton Green. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Brown. Wentworth Brown. Rita, for the last half hour, you've had us all stretched on a rack of worry. I regret that I am some uh, 26 minutes late, Sir Jason. Not at all, Rita. Though your regularity is such that for one awful moment, I feared our clocks were in error. What the devil are you doing with that powder puff? Well, just mine, Sir Jason. I should hope not. F.W.B. Oh, Miss Wentworth Brown joined us today. Daughter of an old friend of mine. Her brother was one of the early suffragettes. She's an ambitious child, anxious to carve out a career for herself. Very bright girl. I have met Miss Brown. Oh, about the green case, I've just been uh, glancing through the file. Seems a perfectly straightforward affair, don't you think? Not altogether, Sir Jason. I, I have a memo for you, which I prepared yesterday afternoon. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I was not able to get back from a very important appointment I had with the Attorney General. Uh, you remember? Uh, yes, Sir Jason. I trust that Lord's cricket ground provided a salubrious background for your discussions. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, well, as it happens, we did uh, drop in for a short time. Uh, how on earth did you know? I have observed in the past that your visits to the headquarters of the Maryland Cricket Club have usually coincided with your wearing their distinguished tie. Oh, very, very, really, indeed. <laughs> well, upon my soul, Rita, <laughs> you surprise me. Uh, do you... Uh, by any chance, uh, follow the game? Indeed, yes, sir. Although I prefer the more homely atmosphere of Kennington Oval. I used to turn out for the old school uh, many years ago, of course. I kept wicket, you know. Oh, a most appealing position. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, it was said of my wicket-keeping rather ambiguously, I fear, that only the very widest deliveries got past me. Oh, indeed. Some of our finest cricketers have enjoyed the advantages of um, an outstanding physique. The great Dr Grace himself. And more recently, the captain of the last all-conquering Australian touring team, Mr. Warwick Armstrong, was a man built on the most alarming scale. Good heavens, reader, I'd no idea that your multifarious fund of knowledge included such noble trivia as the game of cricket. Well, my interest now is largely confined to the statistical details of the game. Indeed, I find the perusal of Mr. John Wisdom's admirable annual almanac a most astringent memory sharpener. Uh, tell me. Now, before you spotted me here yesterday, where did you last come across the MCC tie? Hmm? In the dock of the Old Bailey, Sir Jason. Around the neck of an eminent financier, who I'm happy to say was not entitled to wear it. Bank frauds, you remember, were a speciality of mine. Yes, well, if you'll come into my office, we'll discuss this bank robbery. So, you are not entirely satisfied with this? It seems perfectly clear to me. Whoever perpetrated it knew that considerable sums of currency had been brought from head office that afternoon and deposited in the strong room of which only the manager, Mr Green, had the key. Of this sum, £75,000 disappeared overnight and so did Mr Green. Or rather, he would have, but for the fortunate activity of some bright young constable. Well? Well, um, it's all a little too tidy. Tidy? You have a remarkable flair for epithets, Rita. I suppose it is tidy that Mr Green turns out to be a convict who'd done two years for conversion. Embezzlement and conversion. It was one of my first cases, sir. I'm afraid I was the principal witness against him. It was a matter of some £152, six shillings and eightpence. 
Mr. Green, I should describe as more foolish than criminal. He was a mere stripling at the time and had gotten some difficulty with moneylenders. Poor fellow. Poor fellow. <laughs> you have a very soft heart, Rita. On the contrary, Sir Jason, I see the possibility of evil in everything. It is a failing of mine. I'm afraid I... I have a criminal mind. Yes, I know all about that. And I suppose you believe his cock and bull story that he left a letter saying that he was being blackmailed by an ex-fellow convict and decided to clear out and make a fresh start elsewhere? It is not a very ingenious story, so it could well be true. The only true part of that yarn is that he'd done time. Yes, sir. Wormwood Scrubs. B-Wing. Oh, yes, I was forgetting your intimate knowledge of these establishments. Would it be possible for me to see him there, sir? Oh, where? Mr. Green, in prison. Reader, um, Scotland Yard have covered this case in great thoroughness. I really don't see any reason for our interference. And I would not like them to think that a mere dilettante was interfering with their lawful functions, but if it were possible for me to have just a word with the unfortunate man. Oh, very well, Reader. Doubtless your presence will bring a little sunshine into the darkness of his daily life. Thank you, Sir Jason. And on the understanding that you do nothing that will in any way damage the reputation of this department, I will give you a note to the officer in charge. Thank you, Sir Jason. Detective Inspector Glossop is an old acquaintance of mine. Yes. Well, old acquaintance or not, Rita, tread warily. In this department, we work as a team. And I do not want to see our relationship with Scotland Yard, which is of the most cordial nature, jeopardised for the satisfaction of a personal whim. Indeed not, Sir Jason. That would not be cricket. Thank you. Uh, my name is Reader, J.G. Reader. I was concerned with you in a previous case, a matter of uh, 152 pounds, six shillings and eightpence. Oh? Oh, yes, I remember. Y you're the gentleman who gave evidence against me. I felt considerable sympathy for your time. I thought you were the unhappy victim of a sudden temptation. I was a damn fool. Uh, but it was over 25 years ago, dead and forgotten, I thought. I... Yeah. Mr. Reader, from that day to this, I've never taken a farthing that didn't belong to me. That's true. You can look at my record. Ask the bank. I would never have betrayed their trust. That is what they think. They do? I had a telephone conversation with your head office this morning. They stated quite unequivocally that they thought that you were telling the truth. They did? I, too, am not inclined to disbelieve your story. Thank you. But what have you to do with all this? Oh, I... I beg your pardon. Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. I have been with the department for some time. Uh, that is why I'm here. Now, this blackmailing letter you told the police you received, uh, is it possible to see it? No, I tore it up in case anyone should ever find it. I realize now it was a mistake. Can you recall what it said? Just that he'd recognize me from the scrubs. Unsigned, of course. But I remember the ending well. We'll call tomorrow. Have ten thousand pounds or clear out, please. Please? Dear me, you're very polite. Were there by any chance any foreigners in prison with you? I don't recall any. But what could I do? If I'd gone to the police, all my past would have come up and I'd have had to leave anyway. So I decided to leave there and then. Are you married, Mr. Green? No, but I was going to be rather late in life. Poor girl. What she'll be going through. Did she know you were going away? Oh, yes. I told her some time before. When I'd made a fresh start somewhere else, she was going to join me. And on the very night you were leaving, this um, unfortunate incident occurred? Yes. Her birthday, too. Oh, how very distressing. She's a wonderful girl, Mr. Reader. A good deal younger than me, but so understanding and affectionate. Of course, she has been here to see you. Oh, no. I don't want her to. You see... I think I can trust you, Mr. Reader. If we'd been properly engaged, it would have been different. But she... Well, she's married. Very unhappily. Her husband treated her very badly. They haven't been together for some time. She's divorced him, but the decree hasn't been made absolute yet. 
That's why I could never go about with her or see much of her. Nobody knew about our engagement, although we lived only a few doors from each other. You can imagine how galling it was for me to watch other men making advances to her and not be able to do anything about it. Did she have many uh, admirers? Well, there was one in particular that used to annoy me. Uh, not that she gave him any encouragement, but he was always around. It was on his beat. Literally, that young fool, Constable Burnett. The constable who arrested you? That's right. Ironic, isn't it? Very. He'd fallen for her like a lovesick youth. He used to write her poetry. I ask you, poetry. You wouldn't think it possible in a policeman, would you? There is poetry in every soul, Mr. Green. And a policeman is a man. <laughs> Miss Brown? Oh, uh, there you are. I've, I've just been ringing the bell for you. Oh, yes, I heard it. I just nipped in to see Uncle Jason for a minute. Really? <laughs> He's a friendly old fellow, isn't he? Uh, no doubt. I should like two copies of these notes typed. This office is much cosier than yours, though. I don't think that's fair. Would you like me to mention it to him? No, thank you. Now, these notes... Although there's a lot to be said for bare walls. Have you ever thought of having a mural? Well, Jake, oh, he's a boyfriend of mine. Well, Jacques, really, because he's French and an artist. Well, he does the most fantastic charcoal designs. I fear that's just... Miss Brown, this is a government office, and I have no sanction to turn it over to any designer in charcoal, chalk, paint, pen or gouache. What's gouache? Rita! Well, Uncle's calling you. I heard. Shall I tell him your are No, 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 thank you. If you just... Get those notes typed. I think I'll have a cup of coffee. Can I get you one? Eleven o'clock is, I believe, the statutory hour. Rita! <laughs> He's an impatient old fellow, isn't he? Hmm. Ah, Rita, I was beginning to think that our clocks were fast again. You wanted to see me, Sir Jason? Yes. You'll be interested to know that I've had a letter this morning from the, um, the head office of that bank that was robbed. They seem to think this fellow Green is telling the truth. Indeed. Well, I thought uh, you'd like to know that their view coincided with your own. Oh, it is most gratifying. Yes. Well, that is all, Rita. I wondered if I could have formal leave of absence to make some further inquiries, Sir Jason. Not Green again? No. His young lady. His what? Mr. Green is deeply attached to a young lady whom I think might be of assistance to us. Uh, Cherchez la femme. That is what I would like to do, Sir Jason. Uh, if you could spare me. Yes. What? But, but, but Green is surely far beyond the age of romantic attachments. He must be 50 at least. Oh, to some, that is the prime of life. Is it? I should also like your permission to see Constable Burnett, who arrested Mr. Green. Perhaps you'd like me to suggest to Scotland Yard that you take over the inquiry. I don't think that would be necessary, Sir Jason. But there are certain passages in his statement which I should like him to clarify. Certain sequences of events. What passages? What events? Seeing the man outside the bank, picking up the horseshoe, discovering the night watchman. That uh, man was presumably a green who dodged round the block to get back to his own house. Uh, so Burnett said. But Mr. Green does not strike the eye as a man built to dodge round blocks. Oh. 
In fact, the whole charge implies an athleticism which I should find hard to attribute to an Olympic champion himself. As for those bloody marks... I beg your pardon. I refer to the smears of blood on the dead man's palms. Obviously the result of some sort of struggle. That was not the view of the divisional surgeon. I quote him. What those scratches are on his palms is a mystery. Which I suggest it will remain, unless you're proposing to interview the corpse. I don't think that will be called for. I'm glad to hear it. All right, reader. I don't propose to try and unravel the labyrinthine thread speculation which ramble around your somewhat tortuous mind. You may make any further investigations you consider to be appropriate. Thank you, citizen. This side of the grave. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rita. Does a Miss Magda Gray live here? Yes. I'm sorry to call at such an early hour, but could I have a word with her? She's not feeling very well. Oh, I'm so sorry. I won't keep her long. Miss Gray, there's an old gentleman to see you. What? An old gentleman to see you. I'll be down. Let me take your things. Oh, that's uh, most kind. What a funny hat. Just like my granddad's. No. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, this is the sitting room. Let's go. Excuse me. Miss Magdagrain? Yes. My name is Reader, J.G. Reader. I've just been admiring your lovely flowers from your own garden. No, from a friend of mine. Are you from the police? Not exactly the police. I hold an appointment in the public prosecutor's office, which is analogous to but distinct from a position in the Metropolitan Police Force. I wondered if anybody would come and see me. Mr. Green sent you? Mr. Green told me of your existence. He did not send me. Then why are you here? Mr. Green is on a capital charge of murder. That is very much our province. Do you think he did it? Do you? The police do. Why don't they believe him? Well, the evidence against him is very damning and there is no other possible suspect. There must be some reason for all that elaborate preparation. How did you know about the preparation? It's in the papers. Is it? Yes. I don't know. I wish to God I'd never come to this place. Have you been living here long? About three months. Mr. Green wanted me to come here. He thought we might see more of each other, but it didn't work out that way. Yes, he told me. How did you meet him, Miss Green? Didn't he tell you that? No. Then why should I? I beg your pardon. 
if they did find him guilty, do you think they'd hang him? It is a very serious charge. Have you by any chance a photograph of Mr. Green? Yes. Do you want it? If you'll be so kind. All right. Thank you. It's in my room. Thank you. Greetings on your birthday. That was the day when... Oh, very sad. Did you receive many other birthday presents? Why should I? Do you know Constable Burnett? Why, yes, I know him. Why do you ask? Mr. Green mentioned it to me. I think he was somewhat perturbed by the Constable's attentions to you in the past. He had no need to be. Constable Burnett is a sentimental young man who's inclined to dramatise his relationships. And he knew something of your circumstances? Yes. But nothing of your, uh, your engagement to Mr. Green? No. For obvious reasons, no one knew of that. What reasons? Your husband? Yes. He was not a very kindly man. Was not? I mean, when we were living together, he neglected me. And then when I left him, he became very jealous. Uh, when did you leave him? I'd be grateful if you'd stop asking me questions about my husband. I'm sorry, I have no intention of opening up old wounds. But I am very anxious to get to the bottom of how the unfortunate Mr. Ballot came to his end. Does it matter? He did. Nothing we can do now can bring him back to life. But can preserve the life of another innocent man? I know. I'm sorry. I'm so devoid of hope for myself, I can feel it for no one else. But if Mr. Green isn't convicted, there seems no reason why the two of you shouldn't eventually share your life together, as you intend. No reason. Once you are away from this area, I feel sure that you both will be able to bury the past. Thank you. Is there anything else you want me to tell you? You are of English birth, are you not, Miss Green? Why, yes. Surely that's obvious. Not many English people read German books. Particularly the poems of Heinrich Heine. I am no linguist myself, but I've always understood that of all German poets, he was the most difficult to render into felicitous English. That book was given to me by a friend of mine. A German friend? Yes. He had been a prisoner of war. For some trifling act of friendship, he insisted on leaving me that as a gift. Unfortunately, I have little German, but it was a charming gesture. Indeed it was. Well, I'm most obliged to Miss Green. And I apologise for taking up so much of your time and for any distress which my inquiries may have caused you. I'll see you to the door. Thank you. I brought your coat for you, Mr. Reader. Thank you. Oh, what a wonderful memory you have. Do you want any shopping done, Miss Green? No, thank you, Amanda, but would you get me ten cigarettes? Yes, reference. Can I keep the change? I'll answer that. Oh, hello, Uncle Pat. And how's my little favourite? Ah, good morning, Miss Green. Why are you calling her Miss Green? Good morning, Constable Burnett. This gentleman is from the Public Prosecutor's Office, Mr... Reader. Uh, J.G. Reader, how do you do? How do you do? Just routine inquiries. Anybody who is a neighbour of Mr Green's could be of help to us. But not this lady, sir. I don't think they ever met. So she's just been telling me. Uncle Pat found the murderer single-handed. Oh, yeah, I believe I must congratulate you, Constable. Oh, it's just routine work, sir. Indeed, yes. Well, goodbye again, and thank you. I'll come with you. Sure. Goodbye, sir. Bye.
What does the public prosecutor want with you, Magda? What do you think? Dear to thee, I say, on this auspicious summer day, come swirling leaves, come rain, come shine, may every happiness be thine. Dear me. Good evening, Mr. Reader. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Hoochin. I trust you're in time for your appointment this morning. I was indeed, Mrs. Hoochin. I'm very glad to hear it, though I was considerably perturbed to see that you had left your breakfast. Uh, some of it, Mrs. Hoochin. Most of it, Mr. Reader. And investigating on an empty stomach is of no help to friend or foe. However, I've prepared you a special dinner of sheep's head broth. Thank you, Mrs. Hoochin. Oh, uh, Mrs. Hoochin. I believe I'm right in thinking that in your family there were several members of the constabulary. Oh, indeed, Mr. Reader. You'll remember in my reference I stated that two of my uncles on my father's side were members of the Forfar Constabulary for nearly 30 years. And proud we were of them. I can recall to this day as a wee lassie sitting on my Uncle Hector's knee and playing with his magnificent mouser. Would you describe them as being uh, artistically inclined? Well, my Uncle Hector would always give his bass solo at the police concert, although I never heard it myself. I remember my father saying that Uncle Hector's voice could rival that of a wounded bull. <laughs> I was thinking of uh, poetry. Oh, aye, poetry. Aye. My Uncle Fergus could bring tears to your eyes with his rendering of My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. Not that the poetry of Robbie Burns can ever mean much to a Sassanach, if you'll forgive me, Mr. Reader. I'm not very familiar with the work of Mr. Burns, but I've always found Old Lang Syne most seasonable. Seasonable? organize a full-scale search party. You do have a license, of course. A license? Every owner must in law have a license for their dog, madam. You sure you want to pursue this? I feel as a taxpayer that it is the duty of the police to protect and guard... Licence, madam. Myself who... I can't think what this country's coming to. Cross all hand forth. Do find Clarence. <clears throat> Could I see Constable Burnett, please? Can I be of any assistance, sir? Uh, no, no, thank you. It's most kind, but I... I should like to speak to the constable myself. May I ask the nature of your inquiry, sir? Oh, uh, indeed, I beg your pardon, sir. Most good miss of me. Mr. Reader, public prosecutor's officer. We had a note from your officer. I didn't realize at first. Call Burnett. He's a smart young lad, Burnett, uh, marked for promotion. I'm sure you'll find him very helpful, sir. I, I, I'm sure I shall. Oh, there you are, Burnett. Uh, this is the gentleman from the uh, public prosecutor's office. Oh, yes. I didn't realize it would be you, sir. We met briefly yesterday on his uh, beat. Oh, really? Uh, why don't you take uh, Mr. Reader into the interview room, Burnett? Uh, more private there, sir. Wouldn't you rather have a cup of coffee in the canteen, sir? Oh, that would be very nice. Thank you. This way, sir. Thank you. Pleasure, sir. This way, sir. Oh, please be seated. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I get you anything with your coffee? Just a cup of tea, please. Oh, yes. A uh, cup of tea and a milk coffee. Your photograph was in the local papers again. Did you see it? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I did. Quite the hero of the division, aren't you? Who's your friend in the fancy dress? Shh. He's the top investigator for the director of public prosecutions. Oh, 
I say, you are going up in the world, aren't you? You'll be stationed at the yard soon. Coffee and a cup of tea for Sherlock Holmes. Here we are, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I won't keep you more than a few moments. Oh, pleasure, sir. I'm entirely at your service. <laughs> what? I think I have your coffee. No, that's the tea, sir. Oh. If I may take you back to some of your statement. You said it was your practice when on night patrol to pass the bank every 40 minutes. That's right, sir. Regular as clockwork. And it was your custom on each occasion to look through the window and exchange signals with the night watchman. Yes, sir. My instructions were to wait there until Mr. Melling appeared before moving on. Well, that night, of course, he didn't. Uh, quite so, but earlier on that night, as you were still some distance to the bank, you saw a man standing at the corner just beside it. But you didn't attach any importance that... And indeed, when you glanced in that direction a few moments later, he was gone. Yes. How many moments later? Ah, well, as I said in my statement, my foot struck against something on the pavement. I stooped to pick it up, and on examining it, found it to be a horseshoe. Well, when I glanced again at the corner, the man was gone. But what did you do with the horseshoe? Oh, well, I, uh, I thought I'd keep it. Give to a friend. Whose birthday it was that day? Uh, yes. Come swirling leaves, come rain, come shine, may every happiness be thine. How did you find that? You are the author of that lyric? Well, yes. <laughs> I've always written a bit. And sometimes in the middle of the night. Oh, I've never neglected my duty, sir. Oh, naturally not. But on that particular night, you were inspired to write that poem and leave it together with the horseshoe and a bouquet of flowers on your friend's doorstep. I threw them on her windowsill. Oh. Even more romantic. As a matter of fact, the idea didn't occur to me until after I'd passed her. That is what I wanted to confirm. It was after you picked up the horseshoe that you plucked the flowers, wrote the poem, and delivered your little birthday present. That's right. So, ten minutes at least had elapsed before you're seeing that man at the street corner and continuing on your patrol. If I've done anything wrong, sir. It is never wrong to be in love. Well... Thank you, Constable Burnett. You've told me all I wanted to know. Have I? I trust your zeal in this case will expedite your prospective promotion. Oh, thank you. Oh, one thing, sir. Um, did Miss Grain show you that poem herself? No. Then where did you come across it? In her waste paper basket. Good day, Miss Crane. What is it, Mr. Reader? I hope I'm not disturbing you. I am rather busy. There really is nothing more I have to say to you. But there are one or two queries which I feel sure you could explain. All right. Thank you. Could we not? Very well. Yes, I'm going away. Oh. I'm sorry. How can I stay here? What of Mr. Green? I've written to him. Telling him everything? Explaining why I can't wait for him. I don't think you will have to. It is unlikely that Mr. Green will be in custody after today. What? Why? Because of the advice I intend to give to the public prosecutor. I have, however, come here first to give you a chance to explain. Explain? Miss Grain, you know very well that Mr. Green was not guilty of that murder. It wasn't a murder. How do you know? How do you know? And if you do, why did you not inform the police? I've explained that in my letter. Or perhaps you'll explain it to me. I, I don't know where to begin. Well, let me help you. It was to you, was it not, that Mr. Green gave the information that he'd been in prison many years ago? Yes. The confidence of a man who trusted his future wife. And you took advantage of that to blackmail him. 
No, I didn't. I didn't want to, but... But your friend did. The one who gave you that book. Yes. Your husband. Yes. You're right, he was. He was the German prisoner. I met him when he was working on the land. He'd been badly wounded and was very unhappy. He had only an old father who died before the end of the war and two brothers who were killed. I was kind to him. His gratitude, Mr. Reader, was most touching, most sincere. We fell in love. When the war was over, there was nothing for him to go back to in Germany. There was no work there anyway. So we decided to make a life here together. But it was hopeless. Can't blame my fellow countrymen. He was a German, a Bosch. They wouldn't give him a chance. And he was prepared to do anything, however humble, to try and keep me. But it was no use. Most of the time, I had to keep us both. And he hated that. In a short time, he hated this country and everyone in it except me. Then one day, I met Mr. Green. He was a visitor at a house where I was employed to look after a child. I don't think a woman had ever looked at him in his life. He was a shy, rather pathetic little man. But he was the most influential person I'd ever met. And I wanted to help my husband somehow. So you encouraged him? Yes. I didn't tell him I was married. I let him propose to me, may God forgive me. He gave me all his confidences, including the one that he'd been in jail. And I told my husband. But I swear, Mr. Reader, it was never my intention that he should blackmail him. I tried to stop him. I refused to write that threatening note for him. That I did know. From the wording, it could only be written by one of his fellow countrymen. The rest you can guess. My husband planned the robbery to take place on the night he knew Mr. Green was leaving. He destroyed Mr. Green's letter, brought the money round here and hid it for the time being. In your front garden? Yes. In the central flower bed under the rose bush? Yes. I thought there was something wrong with the nutrition of that bush the first time I saw it, though I confess I came here to find it. I never intended to touch a penny of it, Mr. Reader. It's still there. You can see it for yourself. I believe you. But how do you know all this? From the blood on your husband's hands. When they found him that night, dead, in the manager's office. You know, then, who my husband was. Hmm. His name was Arthur George Malheim, which he changed to Melling. The night watchman. That was the employment Mr. Green had obtained him and which he betrayed. And on that night, when he brought the money back here to bury it, he was naturally in considerable haste and scratched his hands rather badly in the process. I see. It was after that that things went wrong for him. What exactly did happen, Mr. Reader? Well, he returned to the bank where, with true Teutonic thoroughness, he had made the elaborate preparations that you referred to. Can of Toriforms in his position, he waited until Constable Burnett was approaching on his beat. Then he hurried back into the office, fixed the straps on the cotton pad, and waited for the policeman to rescue him before much harm was done. Unfortunately for him, he had reckoned without Burnett's poetical aspirations, and the time that it would take him to assemble his little birthday tribute, so to speak, and lay it at your feet. You mean... It was during that time? It was during that time that your unfortunate husband lost consciousness. The chloroform continued to suffocate him. And when the policeman eventually arrived at the bank, long after he was due, it was too late to save him. So, I was responsible. Oh, God. Do not reproach yourself. And now I must leave you. Oh. 
Aren't you going to arrest me? I am not empowered to do so. But if I may give you some advice, do not go away. And do not wait for the police to come to you. Go to them. You have suffered much. There may be leniency. I sincerely hope so. I will not make my report to the public prosecutor until tomorrow. Good day, Miss Gray. Thank you. 